Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to the University Bookstore for making this happen, and thanks to my colleagues at the MCDM for, may I say it, hosting the after party at the District Lounge following this event. Uh, reading books is thirsty work. So <laughs> I hope you all help me lubricate. <laughs> now, those of you who follow the news know that today was a pretty big news day. This morning around 10 o'clock, hundreds of thousands of people all over the country were sitting by their computers, refreshing their browsers, <laughs> waiting to see what was going to happen. I speak, of course, that because we're two weeks away from the San Diego Comic Con, today is the day that the programming was announced. <laughs> and sure enough, at 10 a.m., there it appeared on the site. And the avid eyes of the 150,000 people who will be heading to San Diego to attend this crazy conference, convention, festival, thing, uh, are looking over what prints out to be generously about 20 pages in a decent sized font, uh, 100 panels uh, in five, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, 100 panels in about 20 different rooms uh, all over the convention center, um, featuring people like George R.R. R. Martin and some of Hollywood's biggest celebrities and uh, the convention floor and all of this stuff. This is only for the first day. Tomorrow you can load Friday's program and then Saturday, Saturday's program. Um, how many people here have been to the San Diego Comic Con? Anybody? Uh, yay. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, San Diego Comic Con is this event that's been taking place for over 40 years now in San Diego. It started out as a gathering of fans. People who liked old comics would get together to talk about them, to meet the creators, to trade the back issues, to sort of geek out among friends because this was not what you would call a mainstream interest. Over the last 40 years, this event has mushroomed into a pop culture singularity um, that really has taken over everything from video games to movies and television, fashion, art, merchandise, all kinds of things, all coming out of this very humble and unassuming medium. As a business author and somebody who looks at the ways that future trends trends in social and economic and globalization, demographics, things like that, affect the world of business. This is kind of a fascinating thing because Comic-Con isn't a metaphor. Comic-Con is incarnate, all of these trends. You just look around and you can see manifested all of the different things that are going on in media and entertainment and publishing in all of these different areas. And you can see threads of the future that are sort of weaving themselves in even as somebody is walking past dressed as Hawkman. <laughs> so that appealed to the futurist in me. It also, um, of course, appealed to the comic fan in me. I've, uh, many of you here know me personally and know that I've been interested in this stuff um, since I was a kid. And the genesis of this book actually is, um, well, it, when I was 10 years old, I was a follower of a comic book called The Spirit. It was reprints of old 1940s comics, and it was being published at that time by an underground publisher called uh, Kitchen Sink Press. And for some reason, I felt moved to write a letter to the editor to this <laughs> magazine, suggesting the casting for a spirit movie that was then under discussion. And so I sent it off, and, I, and the, the editor of the magazine printed the letter. And it was the first time I'd ever seen my name in print. And I thought, this is kind of cool. <laughs> Maybe I should look into this as a profession. The editor of that magazine was a man named Dennis Kitchen, um, whom I came to know later because he represented uh, Will Eisner, who was the artist of the spirit. And through all sorts of ways, we became friends with this guy. And he, after he was finished being a publisher, he became a literary agent. So one night when we were out to dinner, he was sort of kidding around with me because he knew I'd been writing these books about the future of this and the future of that and you know big trends in the world. He says, why don't you use your futurist superpowers to look into the future of comics and entertainment? And I said, if you can get somebody to publish this book, I will write it. And he said, well, that's easy. I'm an agent. <laughs> so 35 years after I sent Dennis Kitchen my letter and he put it into print, I sent him my manuscript all about turning comic books into movies. And he saw that into print also. So 
can't make this stuff up. Life works in weird ways. Um, so this book, Comic-Con and the Business of Pop Culture, is about this convergence of two things. It's about what's going on in the world of media and entertainment and technology and publishing. And it's also about what's going on at the world's wildest and most interesting pop culture festival. And uh, what I'd like to do is read you a short section from the beginning of the book that explains um, basically why I wrote it and why why comics at this moment are so interesting and why they sort of sit at the center of this conversation. And then I would like to read you a little bit um, about the convention itself and what is in store in a couple of weeks when those doors open. The motives for undertaking this quixotic product, project are simple. Comics are fun. I've loved them since I was a kid. And I've amassed quite a collection, along with a ridiculous amount of trivial knowledge that comes with the obsession. Writing about them barely seemed like work. Comics as a medium solve a vexing problem of the information age. At a time when so many shiny things are competing for our attention and demanding our time, comics hit fast and hard. Their design is unique and compelling. The copy is brief. Everything is there on the page in one view. Comics excel at telling certain kinds of stories that have proven especially durable and engrossing but they're handy for delivering all kinds of content and information. They're a big part of the future of communications and a key ingredient in the 21st century media mix, although they often escape our notice. Issues that are now being resolved within the small and insular comics industry will ripple through the global, global entertainment world and affect the way that billions of people consume content. And comics are big business. They sit at the crossroads of art and commerce, their unique style and subject matter power Hollywood blockbusters and New York Times bestsellers. Scan the lists of all-time box office champions, all-time best-selling video games, top-rated TV shows, and best-trafficked blogs and websites. Comics are all over them. But as an industry, they face many of the problems of the 21st century economy. How to mobilize a mass fan base with diverse and sometimes contradictory interests. How to negotiate the, trans the transition to digital distribution and how to translate the magic they muster on the page into new and disparate media channels. If any proof were required, just look at Comic-Con International, San Diego, hereafter known as Comic-Con, or just the Con. <laughs> the sprawling pop culture festival that takes over San Diego for a week every July and contributes an estimated $163 million to the local economy. Comic-Con draws upwards of 130,000 people, more by some estimates and sells out almost instantly, with millions more following the proceedings online or through news reports. My wife Eunice and I have been going to San Diego since the late 1990s, first as attendees and then as part-time event staff. We don't wear costumes or speak Klingon, but we love the craziness, the spectacle, and the energy of so many people all in one place having the time of their lives. We've seen Comic-Con mutate from a gathering of tribes into a pop culture singularity an electrifying, exhausting convergence of comics, movies, TV, video games, fantasy art, fashion, toys, merchandise, and more. In addition to being an entertainment spectacle and a complete madhouse, Comic-Con is the laboratory in which the global future of media is unspooling in real time. When I was attending the 2011 show, it occurred to me that there could be no better framework for discussing business issues affecting the multi-billion dollar entertainment industry the various fields of publishing, technology, communications, and distribution, and the changing relationship between pop culture and its global audience than simply walking around Comic-Con and reporting on what I saw. Let me skip ahead to exactly what's going on at Comic-Con and um, why it's so exciting. This is from a chapter called Welcome to Comic-Con. By the way, the book is set up um, the book walks you through the five days of Comic-Con, starting with preview night, actually starting with the, scr the mad scramble for hotel rooms that precedes uh, anybody showing up at the convention. And then it walks you through the, the, the five days from the setup and the preliminaries to what goes on at each day of the event. And for each one of the things that I'm looking at, it's sort of tied into some of the business issues that I'm talking about. So this is, this is, the, uh, this is the main event. This is, uh, the doors have, uh, are about to fly open. Attention exhibitors boom the PA system. Please move all pallets out of the aisles and return to your booths. The exhibit hall will be opening momentarily. Around the hall, nervous energy reached a fever pitch. The staffs at the large display booths bustled about, 
putting the final touches on their displays and exhibits. Artists neatened up the stacks of comics and original art at their stations and settled into meet the public mode. Forklifts retreated from the floor, mounted high with the last stacks of empty boxes and discarded packing materials. I made a final survey of the hall, taking in the last unobstructed views of the mega media booths and noting where to find particular artists and dealers. It was a Sisyphean chore. No matter how closely one studied the map or wandered around, there always seemed to be a few booths or even entire aisles that remained hidden until, the, until they revealed themselves on Saturday or Sunday afternoon. The posted opening time for the exhibit hall was 6 p.m., but for the past several years, in a savvy exercise of expectation management, the con had opened its doors a few minutes ahead of schedule. About 10 minutes to the hour, the PA boomed again. Attention, exhibitors. Comic-Con 2011 is now open. The line of registered attendees, which ran all the way down the length of the convention center, up the steps, through an endless string of switchbacks and velvet cordoned crowd management areas, through the upper level, and down the massive staircase behind the rear entrance to Hall C, slowly unwound, disgorging tens of thousands into the hall. Almost immediately, a steady stream of people began pouring onto the floor. The PA system exhorted, please, no running in the aisles, an announcement that could only apply to these opening minutes when high-speed mobility was still possible. The first people on the floor who had been waiting in line for most of the day, if not longer, paid no attention. They sprinted to stake their claim on an exclusive toy or poster, a limited edition comic, or a celebrity signature. Others filtered in with a dazed zombie walk, then stopped dead in their tracks a few steps inside the door. I saw what I presumed to be a family of four, dressed in matching Batman, Batgirl, Robin, and Batmite costumes, transfixed in the entryway, eyes darting around the room from corner to corner, unable to process the scale of the hall and the bewildering array of spectacles on display. In less than half an hour, the entire gargantuan space was heaving with a frenzied energy of a stadium-sized crowd. There was a collective quickening of pulse and hyperventilation. People pawed the merchandise, ogled the costumes, snapped photos, explored the elaborate booths, and queued up in lines that spontaneously generated around the hall as stocks of swag drew low. By 7 o'clock, the center aisles were clogged, even as thousands more were still making their way onto the floor. Fire marshals eyed the crowd nervously, muttering into walkie-talkies and making notes on clipboards. Preview night attendance was capped at a fraction of the total number of the four-day registrants because there was no other programming on, for, on Wednesday night to pull people out of the exhibit halls and into the dozens of meeting rooms for panels, game tournaments, film screenings, or autograph signings. There would be more people at the con over the weekend, but the floor would never feel quite as crowded and as intense as it does in those first few hours of preview night. In, 20, in 2001, when Preview Night first opened to four-day attendees, it was mostly an opportunity for collectors to scope out the prices in the inventory at the dealer's table and start conversations that might lead, a few days later, to the purchase of a particularly pricey back issue or piece of original artwork. By 2005, exhibitors were reporting sales on Preview Night that matched levels previously only seen on Saturday afternoon, the traditional height of the con. People wanted to get their purchases out of the way before the programming started in case they had to spend time waiting in lines or doing other activities that would take them off the floor. Preview night was no longer an afterthought. It had become the critical time for buyers and sellers of collectibles, either vintage or new. The lines grew longer. The crowds initially overwhelmed the convention center's ability to handle them, leading, a lot of frust leading to a lot of frustration and wasted time. Should I continue, or would you like to ask some questions, or any? Um, let, me, let me read a little bit more about the, the history and origins of Comic-Con. Um, this year, the con seemed to have, have crowd management down to a science. There appeared to be enough security and volunteers adequately trained in both procedures and etiquette to keep things, ad to keep things moving without seeming too much like a police state. <laughs> This was combined with a willingness or perhaps resignation on the part of attendees to accept more regimentation, given the challenges of having so many amped up fans in one place, some of whom were armed with uncomfortably lifelike swords and weaponry. <laughs> the need for all these rules, systems, and enforcement mechanisms makes logical sense considering the scale of Comic-Con in the 2000s. However, as the thinning gray ponytailed elders of the con will tell you, it was not always this way. San Diego Comic-Con dates back to 1970, 
when organizers led by Scheldorf and a few hundred fans assembled at the U.S. Grant Hotel to meet special guests Jack Kirby and Ray Bradbury, watch vintage horror films, buy and sell back issues, and in later years attend a Saturday night banquet that was open to all attendees. At the early age of comic fandom, San Diego vied with big conventions in New York to be the center of the comics universe. It got a boost in 1976 when a fledgling studio called Lucasfilm showed up with a slideshow introducing its new movie, Star Wars. The shrieks of geek orgasm that shook San Diego <laughs> that year echoed out across the cosmos, an early indication of the force of Comic-Con buzz that would so intoxicate Hollywood marketing departments decades later. Comic-Con became the site of a film festival, a gaming tournament, an academic conference, a retail trade show, and a meeting place for dozens if not hundreds of fan organizations whose members rarely got together in person. Somewhere along the way, the masquerade costume party that was traditionally held on Saturday evening overspilled its levees and flooded across the entire breadth and duration of the con. The cosplay antics of fans dressed as their favorite characters became a staple of media reports of the con in this period giving the show the Mardi Gras reputation it enjoys today. I was not alone in discovering Comic-Con in those years. In 2002, attendance jumped more than 10,000 from 2001. In the midst of a severe economic downturn and a lead up to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, people needed an escape from reality and they knew where to find it. The next year, the exhibit hall expanded to its current size, taking up the entire lower level of the convention center from Hall A to Hall G which formed a gigantic, contiguous, cavernous space crammed with every manner of pop culture diversion. The media started taking note. Big features appeared in Entertainment Weekly, Variety, and USA Today, as well as on network news and business shows. By 2005, Comic-Con attendance crossed the 100,000 mark. Whatever virulent strain the nerds had been cooking up in their parents' basements had gotten loose in the general population. This was the era when even hardened professionals and veteran attendees went weak-kneed at the sight of the crowds, the lines, the endless aisles of booths and tables, the costumes, the noise, the celebrity star power, the crazed over-the-top hype, and the increasingly exclusive parties for A-listers thrown by Hollywood studios and big media outlets. Each year, new voices arise to declare that Comic-Con has lost its way, sold its soul, jumped the shark, each year it sells out faster and the quest for hotel rooms grows more frantic. Each year Eunice and I pack our bags and wonder how could they possibly top last year? And each year they find a way. Um, any of you have questions about the untold secrets and seedy underbelly of Comic-Con or anything having to do with pop culture, video games, comics made into movies, people dressed as Wonder Woman, <laughs> people not dressed as Wonder Woman. <laughs> what trend do you see playing out in the future that some of us in this room would know nothing about? Well, there's a couple of things that are going on right now, like um, trends that are affecting things in general in the publishing and media industry are, on one hand, you know, consolidation in the fact that these big companies have not only own all of the IP assets, but they own all of the channels and they own all of the ways to get those properties to you. So there's a massive effort around what's called transmedia to um, tell these stories across multiple formats and platforms and unite the audiences and the subcultures for each of these different ways of telling the story so that they can get more money from you. Um, but at the same time that all that consolidation is happening, we're seeing radically democratized access to the tools of creativity and distribution. So we're seeing people, I mean comics is a very approachable and easy to understand art form in the first place and all you need to create it really is a pencil and paper and imagination. Um, but now there's tools for making vivid high production value comics and getting them out to readers without benefit of a publisher, sometimes without even you know a distribution intermediary and this is starting to happen. So we're seeing things like last year when the Kindle first came out, the Kindle Fire and everybody was reading um, graphic novels on the Kindle Fire. Over the Christmas holiday, the number one downloaded graphic novel in the Amazon store wasn't The Walking Dead, wasn't Watchmen, you know, it wasn't Batman, it wasn't anything you might have heard of. It was something called How to Be a Supervillain by a young woman named Rachel Yu, who self-published. 
Rachel Yu is 14 years old. This was her third book. <laughs> so the, the two trends that are colliding around this, around bottom-up innovation and all of the cool stuff that's being developed at the grassroots by creators who are themselves entrepreneurs, people who are exploring these new means of storytelling and getting into it in really interesting ways versus the uh, efforts of some of these large companies to consolidate and create you know, this mass audience um, to monetize and gain rents from these intellectual properties that they own um, without having to deal with creators and without having to deal with um, you know, it's sort of a more demanding public. That is the main tension that's happening at Comic-Con. Where it's going right now is hard to say, but you can look at these new things like crowdsourced funding, uh, Kickstarter, for example, is being used to uh, launch a whole bunch of new comic projects and to great effect. And the idea that you can sort of take some of the risk out of launching one of these products because you know that there's um, already an audience out there ready to buy it, um, that's revolutionary. That's really interesting. And so um, there's a lot of evidence and, and sort of, I don't take a side in the book. I try and lay out both sides of the story in terms of where, where the, the trends are pushing. But I just wanted to make clear, you know, Avengers makes one and a half billion dollars. That's a big story. You know, Rachel Yu at age 14 tops the, the bestseller charts um, with a self-published digital book. That's also a big story. Where do you see, um, the, particularly like the big companies like Marvel and DC headed with their digital distribution plans? And do you see that as kind of a bellwether for like the publishing industry as a whole? So the question is, uh, where do I see the trends going with, with what's known in the comics industry as the big two, which is DC and Marvel? So I think the best way to think of the big two is um, basically stewards of a portfolio of intellectual property and content who happen to occasionally publish comic books. <laughs> and, you know, it's like the, the fact is, though, that the stories that power these huge multi-billion dollar movies that are coming out, Avengers and Batman and everything, is based on stories that were originally published sequentially, month by month, issue by issue, in this sort of neglected format. And even though comic book readership has declined a lot, and that the vast majority of younger audience has experienced these characters and these stories primarily in the format of movies or cartoons or video games, and maybe not, don't even know that comics are still being published, you know, comics are really the fundamental storytelling medium. And also the people who produce them are fans and they want to keep it going. So, you know, DC and Marvel exist to put these stories out. They exist to keep the copyrights current. Um, they exist to maybe sell a secondary product to the old-time fans who want to who wanna own and collect them. Um, but the centrality of that publishing enterprise to, where, to everything else that those companies are doing is really in question. And it's possible to envision a future of comics that does not include published comic books by those companies. That said, they're not the entire industry, that there's a whole second strata of the business of independent publishers, of sort of medium-sized publishers that are focused on comics, that don't own the household name IP, but they're trying to get there. Like the Walking Dead is published by Image. Um, you know, uh, Hellboy, which is a pretty popular property, is published by Dark Horse. These are creator-owned. And the reason that the, these other publishers exist is because DC and Marvel really screw the hell out of their creators, both historically and in the moment. And any creator with a great idea for a new product is not going to take it to them. So, you know, again, it's a, there's, there's two sides of the, of the industry that are at work. And this mirrors in many ways what's happening elsewhere in the media and entertainment world, this sort of dichotomy between the, the big, well-funded, you know, owned IP companies and the grassroots and the creative community. Could you possibly see a parallel between floppies and, you know, and vinyl? Like you know, they said that the MP3 and all this was going to destroy vinyl, but there's still a very core group that's very dedicated to vinyl, and they're making music on vinyls every day anyway for that core group. Could floppies end up in a similar category? The question is floppies, which for for the uninitiated means the actual pamphlets, the actual periodical comic books that are that are still published um, monthly or thereabouts. Uh, and is there a future for them that might resemble the future of vinyl in the record industry? And this is interesting because I got a question like this last week in, in New York. Um, so what's happened with vinyl records is that, you know, it's gone from being the mass distribution medium, the default way that people consumed music, to a choice embraced by connoisseurs, fundamentally. 
people who have an aesthetic preference for that way of dealing with music. And it's true. I think that there's, um, there is a future for, for comics in that. And it's something I describe in the book, and it's almost independent of what else happens in the world, because there are people that like the format pure. And those people will always be out there, and there's enough of them to support independently published books. So to me, what's really interesting, though, is you know, we're starting to get into digital comics distribution. And digital comics, they don't have a format. They don't have distribution. They never go out of print. Um, you know, there's a lot of advantages and convenience to that. But I think the big challenge of the next 18 to 24 months, not just for comics, but for all media that has a physical form that it's typically distributed in, is ways to tie digital media and the conveniences of digital media to the physicality of the actual thing. This could be books, this could be records, this could be comics, this could be DVDs, this could be anything where people want to own it. They want to own something. They don't want to just own bits. They want to own atoms. But how do you, but they also want the convenience. So how do you, how do you merge those two things? And there's some really interesting um, models that are going on about, you know, like buy the comic and get it download free and, you know, thing, things like that. Um, and comics are actually at the front end of this. They're actually thinking harder about this than I think the music industry or the book industry is. Does a lot of business get done at Comic Con? Is that a place where people can pitch projects and, 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 and you know, do development deals and those kind of things? Or is it still mainly geared towards the sort of the culture and the collector and the, and, and the, and the demonstration of the products that are already out there? So the question is, does, does uh, Comic-Con, uh, does business get done at Comic-Con, and is this a place where deals are made? And absolutely, um, although, you know, in the past five years, so starting in about, I don't know, 2006 or something like that, in the book I say, you know, it's basically um, the floor was crawling with Armani-clad Prince Charmings cruising the orphanages and poorhouses for Cinderella's to take to the uh, prom. This is the, this is the agents in Hollywood looking for cartoonists with properties to develop into, into movies. And this was a real thing. And, this, and, and for a while, I mean, option money for a comic book is something like $100,000, right? To a studio, they find that money in their pants when they're doing their laundry. <laughs> to a comic artist, that's three years you know, income. So you know, uh, it's very easy for them. Uh, and that has had happened for a lot when, the, when these comic movies were super hot to go and do that. And what's happening is in the last few years, the development deals are starting to cool down a little bit. People are a little dubious about whether these things are actually you know, going to turn into anything lucrative. Um, if you want to develop a property, you need to have name talent attached to it. You need to have a director. You need to have a, a marketing plan. It needs to be a little bit more than, hey, I've done two issues of my Cowboys versus Aliens comic. Let's you know, get Jon Favreau and, and, and eight, you know, $80 million to make this movie. That actually happened, probably more than $80 million. And uh, you know, the movie didn't turn out so well. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of that that's been going on. So for every you know, Men in Black, which is an undiscovered comic book property that got turned into a movie, you know, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't. And um, but yes, uh, a lot of business gets done at Comic Con. It's a hell of a place to do business, um, but it does get done. I'm curious. I'm sure there's lots to choose from. But what are some of like the wackiest things? The wackiest things I've seen. <laughs> really stand out. So uh, this is wacky and maybe not the way that you were intended. But um, <laughs> around 2006, 2007, um, uh, Eunice and I were walking back in the evening from a party or something like that. We were walking back th across the front of the convention center to our hotel. And the exhibit hall was closed, but there was still stuff going on in the, in the convention center. And so as we're walking across the front here, we see this commotion on the escalators, and there's this like there's like this entourage of people, and there's like you know cameras and commotion, and then there's this big limo, a like horrendous you know like an SUV limo, like the most the most obnoxious thing you can imagine is just sitting there idling, you know, in front of the in front of the convention center. We're saying, all right, we're, we're just you know there's not that many people around. I figure we'll stick around and see what this is. We walk out, the door opens. Eunice and I look at each other like, are we seeing what we think we're seeing? It was Paris Hilton oh, no. at Comic Con. Oh, no. Now I don't know what would be weirder: the fact that she thought she should be there, the fact that Comic Con thought she should be there, 
the fact that she might be having a good time at that party. I mean, I'll, I, but that was that was pretty weird. And so, you know, again, uh, in Comic Con terms, there's there's weirdness, and then there's weirdness. <laughs> So the question is, who goes to Comic-Con? I assume you mean as attendees. And so it has gotten kind of difficult as an understatement. Put it this way, the speed with which Comic-Con sells out is now like approaching the limits of the laws of physics. The 100,000 badges went on sale in early April, and they sold out in the first 30 seconds or something like that. If you were, if you were, not, if you were not in the queue by three minutes past the hour, you were not getting one. So, and the hotel rooms, I mean, it's just, it's just a madhouse. And, but one thing to Comic-Con's credit is there's a couple of ways that they can control that because the convention center can't accommodate any more people. They already undercount the attendance to make sure, you know, for the fire marshal's benefit to get as many people in there as they possibly can. And unless they move somewhere outside of San Diego, they can't get a larger facility. So it's constrained that way. Um, and they can't make it any longer because the exhibitors will drop dead. <laughs> so they could go with some kind of gold pass system and just start charging people you know, through the nose. And it, and, and, um, but they haven't done that. The prices have gone up to cover some of the costs, but it's actually still affordable for a family to go to Comic-Con for a day or for the weekend. They get discounted hotel rates, and they reward people who pay with their time. They haven't created some VIP tiered system They've actually kept the access open. And as a result, when you walk around Comic-Con, you're looking at the lucky, not the rich. And you're looking at the patient and not the privileged. And that's, um, you know, if you want to get into the Twilight panel, line up with everybody else. And good luck, because that line is like miles long. <laughs> but the people who are going there is young people, it's old people. It used to be like, you know, all the usual suspects, sort of the comic book guy from The Simpsons and his army of clones. <laughs> Sadly, that is close enough to the truth to not even count as a parody. <laughs> and those guys are still pretty well represented. Um, however, there are more women, there are more families, there are, um, one of the coolest things that I went to last year was, um, in the 70s, they, the comics recruited these Filipino artists because they worked cheap. And they did great, beautiful work and nobody knew who the hell they were. And so they had a panel honoring the Filipino comic artists of the 70s. There's all these sort of old guys that they brought over from, you know, from the Philippines. And I thought this will be a lightly attended panel because it's only like the weird geeks like me that even remember this stuff. Wrong! I showed up at this panel. I was lucky to get in. The line was out the door. It was, you know, it was like the size of this bookstore. It's several hundred people in this room. And 80 to 90 percent Filipino heritage, families. And knew every one of these guys, they were the heroes, they were, the, they were these, these young people that were there were aspiring creators, looking up to these guys, getting a chance to meet them in person. Um, two of them, we lost two of them over this winter that were on that panel. This was your chance to see them, and these people took it, and it was a great, it was a great moment, but it's, a, it's an exhibit of the uh, ethnic and um, economic diversity and the sort of uh, family, because there were people there bringing their kids and introducing them proudly to these guys, it was really quite something. So yeah, there's a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great crowd, and it's a really, um, you know, it's not what you expect sometimes. You mentioned the increase in size. Yes. Do you think that they're going, I know that last year they expanded some of the panels out to three, maybe four other buildings. The, some of the hotels, they took over the, the convention rooms in those hotels as well. Do you think eventually they were just gonna grow, <coughs> outgrow San Diego? Uh, the question is, how, how is Comic-Con going to manage its growth in the future? So in the book, I talk about a couple of things, and there are two growth scenarios where, where comics continue to grow. But there's also some scenarios where we are at a moment that I call in the book peak geek. And that is that this, this period of where comic culture has completely saturated pop culture actually kind of through its own, through no fault of anybody, it's just kind of, just kind of diminishes, and we sort of retreat from this high tide. And comics in a few years looks, we kind of look back on it like we do with disco, right? That it's like, wow, that's really weird that so many people were into that. And, oh, was that me wearing those clothes? You know, and, you know, we didn't see that coming. You can never see it when you're at the peak moment. 
but it is one of the one of the possibilities is that Comic Con goes back to being a niche market. Comics go back to being a subculture, and we don't have to worry about this kind of phenomenal growth. In the near term, I think momentum carries it forward. Certainly, Comic Con can't grow any bigger in San Diego. It can't get any until they expand the convention center, which is apparently happening, mostly to accommodate Comic Con. <laughs> Last year, they had a performance by the Cirque du Soleil um, for free in Petco Field. 60,000 people. There was a line a mile long of people that didn't get in. That's how many people come to this thing. So they've, they've expanded it to as many venues as they can. They're going, there's a thing called Trickster that's happening sort of across the street from Comic-Con that was quite interesting. It's mostly about the art. There's all of these parties and venues are being hosted all over the place and everything. So it's really, there's a lot of things um, going on. But, uh, you know, and the city of San Diego has gone from sort of being this reluctant host to being this sort of painted on smile of like, oh, Comic-Con's in town, welcome everybody, to now just this sort of, you know, uh, we need your money, please come here soon. <laughs> so, you know, what happens with that is, is, is hard to say, but it'll be, it'll be interesting. What if it turns into like another burning man and it just keeps, you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Um, I think we're past that point. You know, I mean, I, I think it has, it has caught fire, exploded, been launched into space, you know, <laughs> gone multidimensional. I mean, this, this, is, this is as big as it can be and still, you know, be recognizable as itself. So um, some, of the, some of the questions about the future, uh, it either moves or it becomes part of a global circuit. Comic cons everywhere are becoming really popular. The one here in Seattle last year had about 30,000 people. This year had something between 40 and 45,000. The first year I went to San Diego Comic Con, it had 40,000 people. So this year, the Comic Con here in Seattle was bigger than the first year that I did San Diego. So, so did Patrick had a question? Um, how do you see this sort of culture influencing other, you know, whether it's the business world or education? Like, it's becoming sort of, you know, so, growing so much, is it starting to affect? How do I see comics culture um, influencing other aspects of other fields of communication, education, things like that? So it's influencing it in all kinds of ways. Actually, there's a whole chapter in the book. First of all, if you look over here in the bookstore, there's like whole uh, sections, aisles of graphic novels, not just in bookstores, but in libraries and in universities where they're being studied. And um, some of them are more substantial and more worthy of study than others. Um, and we're gaining a critical language to distinguish between the ones that are, that are serious works of art and literature and ones that are not. Um, so there's that. It's sort of making advances into well, the areas of high culture. It's being used in education. So there's comics in the classroom are being used in all kinds of ways. Comics in corporate communications. My company does, um, uh, we do uh, um, illustrated training materials and illustrated messaging materials for you know, uh, various companies um, at, because it's so accessible. It's like you're not going to look at some awful white paper, um, says somebody who makes their living writing awful white papers. <laughs> but you are going to read it in comic form because it's easier to read it than not read it. So there's that. Um, but what's really exciting is some of the convergence that's going on with, um, uh, in terms of what you can do with digital media. So one of my favorites is when I was in New York a couple of months ago, I met these people that created this app. So it's a, it's a comic called Dim Sum Warriors. Dim Sum like the Chinese food, right? So the characters in this are like dumplings and chicken feet and stuff like that. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's great. And it's a manga and it's aimed at kids. And it's multilingual in English and Mandarin. And it's being used to teach English to Chinese kids and Chinese to English kids. These people are from Singapore. The, the co-artist, the co-creator of it is a professor at SUNY uh, Stony Brook and is an educational theorist and her husband is an uh, artist. And they put this together, it's on the iPad, it's in the store, it's independent, self-published. And um, so you can look at it, it'll read the text for you so you can, uh, you can get the meaning of it in the context of the story, which is proven to be a really good way to um, learn, st learn a language. And uh, you know, it, it'll read it back to you in audio. You can repeat, you know, like there's all the functionality of a digital tool and all the accessibility of a comic book. And it's self-created and independently distributed. And there is millions of stuff like things like this that are happening right now. So the amount of innovation and the ways that this medium and the converged medium is being brought to other areas is really uh, quite interesting. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the, the who's in charge, the governing body, and how that has evolved. Are they a nonprofit? Are they profit? Or do they license Comic Cons to other, you know? So the question is about the organizational body that runs Comic Con. So Comic Con International is a nonprofit. And it has been, it is run, um, so these founders got together in the, in the uh, early 70s, and it was basically a bunch of nerdy guys that mounted this convention. And it has evolved over the years, and it's a big nonprofit. But they're animated by a mission statement. The mission statement is to bring this art and medium to a wider audience. And they're very successful at this, and some of the decisions they're making about how they're l managing their growth and limiting access um, and managing security without, you know, and balancing all of these competing things, it's really hard to second guess them. I mean, they, they do an incredibly good job organizing that. Now, there's all these other Comic Cons that are not affiliated with, with CCI that are for profit. And there, there's companies like Reed Elsevier and, and Reed Pop that does like the New York Comic Con, which gets 100,000 people. They run that for profit. Uh, Emerald City Comic Con is run by an independent group. Uh, I think they're for, they're for profit. Also, but mostly, I mean, it's like you don't get into the, to this business to make a stack of money. Um, you know, it's a labor of love for the people that do it. It's an opportunity to invite and meet the people that you want to see. So it's like, you know, hey, William Shatner, want to come to our con? Mm -hmm. You know, let's have dinner with the organizers before you go on stage. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. So there's a lot of that that goes on too. But anyway, it's it's a uh, it's become complicated. It's become kind of a logistical challenge. But in my experience, nobody does it better than the people that do the San Diego show. How are, we, how are we doing for time? Uh, Should I? We have about 15 minutes, so if you want to take a, two or three more questions, then we can move yeah. on to the signing portion. Okay. If anybody has a, last, any questions, then we can sign, sign some books. <coughs> Anybody? I just have to ask. Yes. Have you and Eunice ever cosplayed? <laughs> not, since I, not since I was like 10. <laughs> My father has the pictures in an envelope in a vault <laughs> at the center of the earth. But I'm told they look really cute. <laughs> Who were you at 10? Who was I at 10? I, was, I think I was like the specter or something. I don't know. And my friend was, my friend was the Hulk. He was painted green. I've seen that. But yeah, they were different times. <laughs> the, the highlight of that, con that, of that uh, particular costume thing was there was a, uh, there was a young woman there um, dressed as Red Sonia, who uh, if the fans will know uh, her outfit is a metal bikini. <laughs> And a very large sword. So this was this very tall, statuesque, red-headed woman. Um, and it turns out that she later became a comic creator of some renown herself. And we ran into her at a party uh, last year at Comic-Con because they had a reunion of, of comic creators. And I saw her name tag and I said, I said, you may not get this question a lot, but um, I was at this Comic-Con in 1976. And I seem to remember somebody of this name dressed as Red Sonia. Oh, she went red. It was great. She was like, oh my god, how old were you? I was like, old enough. <laughs> that is so funny. So do you dress up? I don't. This is, this is as close as I get to a costume, I'm sorry. Anybody else? Last, last call, and then we'll, go to, we'll sign some books. All right, well, thank you all for coming out. I hope you, I hope you enjoy it.